Today we begin a series, a three to four week series on intention, the power of intention. We all know what intention is, right? It, it often shows up and sounds like this. Lady Willpower, it's now or never. I did it my way. I'm all right. Nobody worry about me. One, two, three. It's the eye of the tiger. It's the thrill of the fight. Balboa running up those stairs. <laughs> Intention by brute force. Intention by brute force. The week before last, I was on vacation visiting friends of mine that live in Boulder, Colorado. And <clears throat> friends of theirs said that we would be welcome to use their condominium for a couple days because they weren't going to be using it. And their condominium is situated in between uh, four or five beautiful areas to ski. So um, I was with my friends Tom and, Bob, uh, Tom and Barb and Tom had to work a few more days. So he said, you guys go ahead, I'll catch up with you. So Barbara and I went up into the mountains and we first started off in the western part of the state. And after skiing a full day there, and meeting some other friends of Barb and Tom's uh, after the, the ski and, um, and catching some dinner, we headed back east to the condominium that we had been gifted. Well, by the time we got there, it was about quarter to 10. We were absolutely toast, exhausted. All we wanted to do was just get to sleep. So uh, Barbara has the combination for the key lock that's on the door frame, this little key box. You've seen it. So she punches in the combination and takes out the keys and opens the door. And we had a lot of stuff in the car to bring in. And she had, um, we brought in about maybe two thirds of it and it's scattered all over the, the hallway. And so uh, she opens the door, uh, pushes it open, throws in the few things she has in her hands and says to me, you bring in the rest of the things from the hallway, I'll go back up to the, the car and get the rest. So I say, fine. And uh, so I, uh, the door's on a, on a spring hinge. So it's starting to close, and I, I you know, push it open. <laughs> and I reach down, and I pick up the few bags here, and I, I put them inside. And the door's closing again, and I push it open again. And I reach out farther and pick out, you know, pick up the ski boots we have, and we put those inside behind the door. And the door's closing again, I push it open. And my suitcase and backpack are even further out. So I, I walk out to get them, and I grab them, and as I turn around, the door closes. So I, I walked over to the door, turned the handle. No way. The door says to me, way. Locked. It won't turn. And where do you think the keys are? So, so I, I turn it again, because it's like I'm telling myself, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. Yeah, it just it says to me. This can't be happening to me. Why <laughs> me? It's locked. So I, I stand there, which it seemed like I stood there for an eternity until Barbara came back through the door and finally shows up, you know, arms full. And, and as soon as she comes through the door, I say, Barbara, and she looks up and I said, we have a problem. Now, she knows that I kid a lot, and I said, seriously, <laughs> we have a problem. So she comes over, and I said, can you, can you contact uh, Sue and Ron, the owners? And she said, my cell phone is inside. I said, well, here's mine. She said, the phone number, the phone number is inside. 
So she says, okay, I can call Sue and Bob. There's a lot of Sues in Colorado. Right? <laughs> Sue and Ron, Sue and Bob. She goes, I'll call Sue and Bob, mutual friends of Sue and Ron's. I have their number, and uh, I know it by, and, and, uh, and we'll get Sue and Ron's phone number. So, so she's making these series of phone calls. Now, as she's doing this, this is what I'm doing. I am visualizing myself on the other side of that door, <laughs> sitting in this warm, inviting, two-bedroom kind of me. And I look at the door lock. I focus on the door lock, because that is the only thing in the universe standing between me and that warm, two-bedroom condominium and those wonderful beds waiting for us. The only thing. And I know the only thing I need is something to cause those tumblers to turn. That's all I need. That's the only thing I need. And I make the intention of being inside. And then I look around. Like, what, what is, what, what's here that could cause those tumblers to turn? Because it's the only thing that has to happen. It's a very simple movement. And I see, sitting on top of my suitcase, Barbara's key ring. It's got like seven keys on it. So I pick it up. And I start with the most logical choices, the longer one, because the lock looks like it's a pretty big lock. So I try the longest key. It won't even go in. I try the second, third, fourth key. Again, big, substantial key. They won't, won't begin to go in. I go through the first six keys. I get to the last key, the seventh key. It's this tiny little dinky little key. It's that long. I kid you not. But I intend to be inside. So I put that key in. It goes in. It turns. The door opens. I think it's a miracle. <laughs> Barb's pacing on the other side talking to her. I go, Barb? She turns around and looks, and she says, it's a miracle. <laughs> and I think to myself, such is the power of intention. I, I, the, the, and the next night, we were having uh, dinner. Uh, it was Tom and Barb and, um, and Larry and Catherine. We ran out of Sue's. <clears throat> and, and we told this story. And Catherine looked at me and said, I never would have thought to try those keys. And again, I thought, such is the power of intention. Now, you may be sitting here going, well, that's an okay story, Dana. <laughs> and I'm even glad you got inside. But how do we know that it's intention and not mere coincidence? Well, let's take another look, maybe a new perspective on what intention actually is. Now, if anyone, and I'm very serious about this, if anyone here has any pulmonary or cardiac problems, please do not participate in this exercise. But if you don't have any of those current challenges, stop breathing. Now, Anybody still not breathing? <laughs> Keep going. See, I, I didn't take a big breath. I just stopped where I was. I think everybody's breathing by now, yes? Is everybody okay? Nobody's, is Joe still going? I'm going to keep going. Joe, you keep going. When I said stop breathing, you intended to stop breathing. And even now, even now, Joe's breathing. <laughs> Something breathed us. Something intended us to breathe. Even though your mind, your ego self said, I'll, I'll, I'll do what he said, I'll stop breathing. Something intended you to breathe. That something is the same thing that intends your heart to beat. 
It's the same thing that intends your food to digest. It's the same thing that intends your hair to grow. It's the same thing that intends a baby to grow into a young lady or man, a woman, a dog, a senior. That's the intention I'm talking about. There is intention, mindful intention in the universe. And science has never come close to defining what that intention is. Although there are scientists that have absolutely spoken to it, that have absolutely identified it. I'm going to read this, but you can read with me if you like, uh, in our bulletin. Max Planck was a physicist and also the founder of quantum theory. I mean, is, is there anybody not heard of quantum theory? I mean, not that we're all experts, but we're aware of it. Uh, our, our theme for the year is I am making a spiritual quantum leap. Quantum theory has been the rage now for decades and will continue to be because it holds more secrets of the physical universe. But there are some things that even quantum theory doesn't tell us. And Max Planck, the scientist who founded it, said this. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind, capital M. This mind is the matrix of all matter. I don't know if Charles and Merle Fillmore, the founders of Unity, were aware of Planck's work. They were certainly contemporaries. They lived at the same time. They were working at the same time. But certainly, this statement could have been written by the Fillmore's. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force, an intended force. When scientists take two particles and they place them inside a, a massive particle accelerator, and they send them, and, and particle accelerators are, are, are big circles, and um, when they send them in opposite directions at virtually light speed, bringing them around at light speed and colliding them, do you know what they find after the collision when they open the particle accelerator? No thing there. It's gone. Particles do not give rise to other particles. An unseen force is the matrix of all matter, of all creation. Every, not, I can't say every, so many scientists, probably most scientists that I've read in the last 20 years are coming to the same ineffable conclusion. That there is a force that creates everything. It's in a field of intention that creates everything. Now, remembering Max Planck's words, and I want to share this from Carlos Castaneda. Carlos Castaneda he passed, uh, I believe, in the mid-80s, was an American anthropologist and a sorcerer. I said sorcerer. Okay. There, there were some guffaws there. No guffaws. Sorcerer. You think of Walt Disney and, you know, like, like Sorcerer's Apprentice, a new movie. Um, you know what a sorcerer is? One who faces the source. One who faces the source, that's capital S, source. What is one of our most common other words for God, for spirit? Source. That's what a sorcerer is. Just another, another branch of unity. Kind of. But more so than not. But he was a practice, he practiced what we practice. This is what he says. In the universe, there is an immeasurable, indescribable force, same word that Max Planck used, 